Well, we're ready for lesson two in our uh, study called Rethinking Hell. And as we left off last uh, time, we began to discuss that there, were, that there are four different words that are translated as hell in many of the English translations. And yet, none of these words have the actual meaning of the word hell as we know it, as a place of eternal conscious torment. Uh, and so uh, we're going to pick up with word number three right now, and that is the word Hades. Some uh, say the pronunciation is Hades uh, because there is a Greek god who is pronounced, the, the name is Hades or Hades. It's a Greek word. It's, very, it's equivalent to the Old Testament word Sheol that we looked at in our previous uh, lesson. Now, what we find when we get to the New Testament is among the Jewish people, uh, the people of that day, there, there's an evolution in thinking that is taking place regarding what happens to people when they die. Uh, as I said to you last lesson, um, in the Old Testament, the, 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 the general consensus, the general idea was that when people die, their bodies go into the grave. Um, but as, again, there's been a change in thinking, and there's this, there's this idea that uh, the dead go to a place and they await... Uh, future resurrection. Uh, even in the New Testament, we have two different groups that debated this subject, the religious groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And the Sadducees were a religious group that did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe that. They held to this older view that the body, when you die, that's it. The body goes to the grave. The Pharisees were saying, no, there is actually uh, a resurrection. Now, they all believed that the dead went to the same place, all of the dead, all dead go to the same place. There was just this idea that there was different compartments. You can see that idea in the parable or story of the rich man and Lazarus where there's different compartments. And so it appears to me that Jesus is using that idea in sharing this story. Let me also say this real quickly. Simply because Jesus uses a story that was common uh, to the people, the understanding of the people, doesn't mean he's endorsing the idea. He's just using it as a way to teach. And so, uh, for instance, in his book, What is Hell, Jeremy Myers uses the illustration. Uh, again, by the way, uh, What is Hell by Jeremy Myers, outstanding book uh, on this subject. He, he talks about the idea of uh, the pearly gates and Peter standing at the pearly gates. Now that's just a kind of a myth of our time, yet we, we could use that in a story in order to make a point. Doesn't mean we would be endorsing the idea that there's actually a place where Peter is waiting at the gate. Uh, but the idea is that there's this compartment uh, where all the dead go, and it's kind of the holding tank for the dead. Here's, here's a verse in Matthew 16, 18, where Hades is used. Um, and I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Or many times, in many older versions, that was translated as the gates of hell will not overcome it. And again, uh, whenever you look at that verse, there's this idea, hell has gates. We, the church, are on the offense. And it's not like we're hiding behind our gates. It's actually hell is behind the gates and we're attacking. But one thing that I find very interesting in that analogy that Jesus used is that church, the church is on earth. And if we, the church, are attacking the gates of Hades, doesn't it make some sense that the gates of Hades or Hades itself is a place here on earth? So I think in the mind of Jesus, at least from this verse, he's not thinking of a dwelling place for evil people. Yet, many times, it's exactly what that word, because of certain English translations, that's what people think of when they hear that word. And so, again, that shapes our idea of hell. I'm telling you this because uh, the whole time I was brought up in this understanding, nobody was really taking the time to walk me through to, to help me understand the different meanings of these words and how that could impact 
how we have our overall view of hell. One other word that we'll look at, and it's the word Tartarus, and it's only used once in the New Testament. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, where Peter says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell. Well, the Greek word is Tartarus. Putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Once again, as Hades, the word Tartarus is part of Greek mythology. It's very possible that Peter was borrowing from Greek mythology in order to make a point. Uh, again, that doesn't mean that Peter is endorsing it. It would simply mean that he was simply using it as a teaching tool. Um, it's referring to some angels that's being reserved or held in chains of darkness. We don't know who those angels are. Some think that's a reference to all of the angels who fell. Some think it's a, a reference to a particular group of angels that are described in the book of Genesis chapter 6 where God may have restricted or limited their, uh, their actions and uh, their access. Um, so is this literal? Is this symbolic? Either way, you want to interpret that. Either way, it's obvious that Peter is not referring to human beings being sent to a place called hell. So, we have Sheol, uh, we have Gehenna, we have Hades or Hades, and we have this place called uh, Tartarus. And all four of these words have been translated as hell. So, I think my point is, it's not as clear as some try to make it. Once again, in all of this, in all of this, with all of these different words that are used, the question is not, the question is not, is there a hell or is there an uh, end of time punishment or an end of time judgment? That's not what's at question. What is at question is what is the nature of, of hell. In other words, what is hell like? Uh, what is the duration of hell? And what is the purpose of hell? That's the questions that we're asking. And once again, uh, throughout church history, there have been three different approaches to answering that question. And by the way, as I share these with you, as we begin to look at them, they may differ from your understanding. That doesn't make them wrong. It just makes them different from the way that you have understood it. Now, observation number two in this whole idea of rethinking hell is a really simple observation, and that is that the Bible, the scriptures, require interpretation. The Bible requires interpretation by human beings, and that means that although the Bible uh, is infallible, inspired Word of God, we human beings are certainly uh, fallible. Uh, so the Bible is translated by humans. We've already seen. Where, in, in my opinion, if, if Gehenna is a real place, it should be called that. Um, we've already seen that human beings can bring their own ideas and own, you know, uh, preconceived ideas to interpretation. And so uh, as it comes to taking the English translations that we have and we seek to interpret those, we are prone to making mistakes. They're not perfect. This doesn't mean we can't know anything. We can. It simply means that we need to be careful and, and then it, we take scripture, and we take our own personal experiences, and we take reason, and we take tradition, we take what has happened and handed down to us through the ages from previous believers, and that's how we come to conclusions on what the Bible teaches. But because human beings interpret it differently, there are times we get disagreements. But let me assure you of this. There is no disagreement that Jesus is Lord. This is crystal clear. This is the center and core of our faith. And, and, and on that, there is no and cannot be. There's no disagreement. There cannot be any. This is clear that 
Jesus Christ is Lord, and Jesus is the meaning and purpose of Scripture. All Scripture is pointing to Him. Outside of that, we come up with doctrines and ideas, and sometimes we disagree. And I will say this, if you hold onto your view too tightly, and you're unwilling to re-examine in the light of Scripture, then I would suggest that you are placing tradition higher than the Scripture. You're placing your tradition, your understanding, higher than what the Bible says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21 says this, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. And then it says, But test them all. Hold on to what is good. Test them. That's exactly what we're doing. And particularly when you come to a subject when there is no consensus. When you come to a subject when there has not been a consensus throughout church history, then you're going to have different ideas. And let me just say to you that when it comes to the doctrine of hell, the doctrine of hell has not enjoyed a level of consensus. It's open to challenge. So, observation number three. Sincere Christians have held three views concerning the existence of hell. So, uh, before me, uh, you can see I have rock, paper, scissors, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Let me just say that serious students throughout, uh, you know, church history have debated the scriptures around the subject of hell, and I think I've made that point clear. And if, if you would like to, uh, you know, study more about that, you say, man, I'd really like to get into that. Uh, there's a scholarly book by a gentleman by the name of Edward Beecher on the history and opinions on the doctrine of retribution, I believe is the name of it. And that really gets into the history uh, of how the, the church have, has wrestled with this particular uh, subject. This may surprise many Christians that have been taught only one possibility, but that's really not the case. Matter of fact, in early church history, uh, when I talk about early church history, I'm talking about, we're talking about church fathers who were taught by the, the apostles. So you've got church fathers who are teaching church fathers and teaching who, that's who we refer to them as church fathers. They're just leaders of the early, earliest churches. And at that time, there were actually six major um, centers of Christianity. And what I mean by that is in different places, there uh, you know, are this kind of like a library. It's where books and writings are contained. And they have certain ideas about uh, the subject of hell. And all three of these ideas that I'm going to mention to you are taught at these, well, we'll just refer to them as centers of Christianity. All three of them point to Scripture as the basis of their conclusions. The strength of their argument is based on Scripture. That's why oftentimes... When I'm in a discussion with somebody, they'll say, what about this verse, and what about this verse, and what about this verse? And if you can just picture this, individuals can play scripture ping pong all day long. Or here's this verse, and then somebody said, well, what do you do about this verse? And well, what do you do about this verse? And what do you do about this verse? And with, the truth is, what we need to understand is, is that th all three positions can point to verses to make their case. All three of them can. So what do we do? It requires us to, uh, again, I think what it requires us to do is look at the meta-narrative. What is the whole thing of Scripture? And these verses are held, uh, you know, within them. Let, let, me, let me give you a little example, okay? Um, the subject of marriage and divorce. Um, if you go to the book of Mark, you'll find a verse that says... Um, not to divorce or remarry. Now, if you were then, and if that's, that's their verse, and if that's your, you could take your position and say, here's the position based on this verse. You could go to the book of Matthew. And Matthew adds an exception. He, does, he doesn't say the same thing as Mark. He adds, well, the exception would be, you know, unfaithfulness. And then later, in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about another exception. 
And you see, what I'm saying is, is that each verse, if taken on its own, you know, individuals could get different ideas. But what we have to do is we've got to take all of Scripture together and say, wait a minute, these th seem to be saying some different things. And so how do we hold these together in tension? And that's what we're trying to do because at face value, if you just look at a verse at face value, some verses appear very clear, but then how does it look in light of all of the verses? So here's what we're gonna do. In our next lesson, we're gonna to begin to get into these three things and we're gonna be using these things as our examples of rock, paper, and scissors. So we'll get into that in our next lesson.